We're very happy this year to introduce uh, someone new to our group. Uh, this is Dr. Michelle Dean. Uh, she is um, an assistant professor of special education at uh, Cal State University Channel Islands. So we welcome her very much, and she'll be speaking to us uh, today about adolescents with autism spectrum disorder and social skills groups at school. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay. Um, okay, today I'm going to talk about various school-based interventions and the context in which kids with autism socialize at school. And I'm going to primarily be talking about kiddos with autism who have an IQ over 70 and are fully included in the general education classroom. So we know many kids with autism are, in fact, included in the general education setting. And we know that for all kids, schools are a primary place to make friends. And then we know that parents really prefer inclusion because it gives kids with autism close proximity to typically develop developing peers, and this should increase opportunities or social opportunities. And yet, we know that children and adolescents with autism have a hard time making and keeping friends. So it seems that inclusion in and it of itself is, is not enough, and these kids and adolescents need additional supports at school in the inclusive setting. But there are many factors to consider. Oops. Oh, you know what? They have it on the back one. So. Okay, you can got it. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that. Back on track. So, there are many factors to consider when thinking about social skills in inclusive settings. First of all, there are different social intervention models that may work that I'm going to talk about today. Also, the school setting. Social engagement in elementary school looks a lot different than social engagement in secondary schools. And participating characteristics. Individuals with autism come in with a certain set of traits and characteristics, and we need to consider that when we're thinking about their social experiences. And finally, it is well established that starting in preschool and persisting through adolescence that Children segregate by gender when making friends. So gender is, has a salient influence on the way kids socialize and their social experiences. So context matters when we're thinking about social skills for children in inclusive settings. So I'm going to talk about some several, a couple of different social skills interventions that have been uh, implemented in school settings. There's clinic-based approaches, which usually include kiddos with autism or other kiddos with significant social challenges. Peer-mediated interventions include children with autism or adolescents with autism and typically developing peers. And then there's a one-to-one -one approach, an individual with autism with a clinician. So the work of Connie Kazri and colleagues, we went into elementary school classrooms and implemented social skills interventions. So we just wanted to think about how kids make friends. One way kids make friends is they make friends with kids that they're around regularly, so within a geographical compatibility or the same context. Children also make friends with kids that they have share similarities. Either they like the same things, they come from similar cultural backgrounds, they're the same gender. And so we thought about designing interventions that uh, keep this in mind, give the children proximity and also sharing interests. We had 137 kids in elementary school, K through five, uh, 137 participants with autism, and we randomized them to one of two intervention treatments. The engaged condition was peer mediated. So we had a student with autism and two to three typically developing peers. And these peers were nominated by their teachers as having good social skills. Children were also uh, randomized to the skills condition. So the skills condition was more like a clinic-based intervention where individuals with autism came from different classes across the school and they met during lunchtime or recess and they had a social skills intervention. So everyone in the group had autism or social challenges. 
And we looked at social outcomes. We looked at how individuals with autism were socializing or how, what their joint engagement looked like at school. And we found that individuals in the skills condition actually increased joint engagement significantly more on the playground. What we did, what we realized, is that we introduced these individuals with autism who were either in the periphery of social groups or isolated. We introduced them to each other during lunchtime. And so they found a way to find each other during, during recess times to play. But what we noticed is that there was child characteristics that made a difference. So individuals whose teachers reported them of having higher conflict and less closeness, these individuals made the most significant gains. So this tells us that child characteristics influence the intervention, how not every intervention is appropriate for all children. In another study, pardon me, in another study, uh, Connie Kasri and colleagues randomized 60 children with autism to two different intervention conditions. One was peer-mediated, and the other was a one-to-one -one clinician and child with autism, where they together would work on select social skills. Other children had a combination, and then there was a business as usual where students didn't receive intervention. Um, and what we looked at was social networks, or the social outcomes. What, uh, how were these kids socially connected to their classmates? So let me give you a little breakdown of what that looks like. We go into the general education classroom, and we ask all students with signed consent, tell us who you'd like to hang out with in your classroom. Then circle the names of your three closest friends and put a star next to the name of your closest friend. Then tell us who in your class you don't like to hang out with. And then we ask kids, Tell us who in your class hangs out together. You can list your group of friends. You can list other groups of friends that maybe you don't hang out with, but you know they hang out together regularly. And then we're able to do some statistics and identify significant correlations between classmates. And that looks like this. So once we enter the data, we can look at significant peer groups or salient relationships. So what we, our goal is, is to have the child with autism who is either tends to be isolated or in the periphery of social groups, we would like to move them closer and have them more salient in the social structure of their class. So what we found was this peer-mediated condition where we had peers actively engaged in trying to support and facilitate engagement of the child with autism was the most beneficial in improving the uh, child with autism social network salience. And that we noticed at exit, there was a significant increase in the child's social salience, and that sustained until follow-up. And so here's what that looks like with the social maps. And you, as you can see, in the first quadrant, our kiddo with autism is isolated. By exit, or upon completion of the intervention, they have joined a small peer group. And at follow-up, this kid is now still engaged, has four salient relationships, but those friends are part of a larger peer group. So this child is now very connected within the social structure at school. So, as I mentioned earlier, socializing in elementary school is very different than socializing in adolescence. Elementary school, we play kickball. In adolescence, we like to hang out. And that can be really hard for our kiddos with autism. And so we did a randomized controlled trial to measure the effectiveness of two different um, intervention approaches. One was clinic-based and one was peer-mediated. So we use the same skills. These, the skills in the engaged interventions were adapted so the topics were appropriate for adolescents. The skills condition was individual adolescents with autism. The only people in the group are adolescents with autism or other adolescents with significant social challenges, as identified by their teachers or school administrators. And then the groups were led by a clinician. They had homework every week where the adolescents were told to go out and practice skills and come back next week and report how you use the skills in your everyday life. 
The engaged condition was peer mediated. So it was individuals with autism and then a couple typically developing peers. And this was started uh, as adult facilitated, but eventually throughout the course of the intervention, peer mentors took over and facilitated the groups. And so these, this group had homework too. They were encouraged to hang out with each other outside of group. Um, the peer mentors, we also did a peer mentor training. So prior to the start of the intervention, we met with the peer mentors to talk to them about kids who have social challenges. We did not tell them that they were working with adolescents with autism. And we taught them some strategies of how to engage adolescents who were, had s difficult time socializing at school. Uh, we met with them prior to the start of the intervention and then in between sessions three and four, and it was an eight-week intervention. So what we found is that both the skills and the engage interventions, uh, participants in both the skills and the engage interventions increased their joint engagement at follow-up and they decreased solitary behavior at follow-up. But what we found is that at exit, individuals in the skills condition reported significantly more social stress, and they reported that their interpersonal relationships were more impacted. Um, and at follow-up, these same participants, the skills participants, reported having greater behavior problems and greater, significantly greater emotional symptoms. And these findings are consistent with uh, the literature that shows that children who have social challenges, awareness of one's own social challenges is associated with social stress. And also, adolescents with autism, their awareness of their social challenges is also related to reputational concerns. So if I know that I have social challenges, then I'm very concerned, or I can be concerned about what other people are thinking, and that can be very stressful for adolescents. Individuals in the engaged condition, however, um, also increased joint engagement and decreased solitary, but they reported an increase of friends at exit, and they did not have the co-occurring symptoms post-intervention. So what we learned from this is that adolescents with autism benefit from social schools interventions in inclusive settings, and there appears to be a benefit of using peers. Peers seem to be able to buffer some of the social, emotional, and stressful social experiences. And so peer training provided these facilitated and integrated social opportunities that allowed individuals with autism to practice socializing in the normative peer culture in an inclusive setting at school. So another salient context of socialization in an inclusive setting is gender. We know that individuals with autism have a difficult time socializing at school, but we know less about the influence of being a girl or a boy and how that influences your ability to make friends at school. So first we want, the first thing we wanted to look at was do children with autism follow the same patterns that we expect of typically developing children? And that is girls like to hang out with girls and boys like to hang out with boys. So we did a secondary analysis of um, data that were collected from the two elementary school intervention studies. Um, we examined 100 participants. There were 25 participants in each group. Uh, 25 girls with autism were matched to boys with autism by age, IQ, city of residence. And then we matched the boys and girls with autism to typically developing children um, who were in their same class, the same age, and the same gender. We looked at the social network data and we disaggregated it by gender. So if you look at this map, you'll see that E5 is a female and she is connected to four other females and one male. And what we found is that children with autism do indeed follow the same patterns as typically developing children. Girls tend to denominate and receive nominations from girls. Boys tend to denominate and receive nominations from boys. And then we looked a little bit more closely at the social context, and we saw that typically developing girls cast a really wide net when they are nominating friends and receive nominations. So we looked at girls with autism, thinking that since girls like girl, girls nominate girls, then girls with autism should be in a position to receive more friend nominations than boys with autism. But in fact, they didn't. 
Boys and girls with autism received about the same number of friend nominations. So being a girl did not appear to benefit girls with autism. Then we looked at rejection scores, and we realized that uh, boys were, were rejected more than girls. Individuals with autism were rejected more than typically developing students. And boys with autism were rejected more than anyone else. So when we think about that in the context of girls with autism, we realize now that they're not being rejected, but they're also not being nominated as friends to the same extent as they're typically developing girls. So they appear to be overlooked and not recognized on the social radar of their class. So we wanted to look more closely at this because we want to understand why we have difficulty identifying and recognizing autism in girls. And we know that girls with autism have been uh, described as having better able to use compensatory behaviors that mask their social challenges at school. Um, and this is called the camouflage hypothesis. But to think about the word camouflage, camouflage highlights the importance of the environment. So to better understand why we have difficulties identifying autism in girls, we want to look at the social landscape at school. So we looked at 96 kids typically developing and girls and boys with autism. We had 24 girls that we matched to 24 boys with autism. Uh, we matched by IQ, city of residence, uh, age, and then we matched them to typically developing kids who went to the same school, were the same age, and the same gender. What we found was, um, and we examined uh, the joint engagement, the engagement states of the kids on the playground, and we also examined their most salient activities within each engagement state. So what we found was typically developing boys spent most of their recess or the observation interval uh, in games. In fact, they played significantly more games than all other groups. And within the games, their most salient activities were ball games. Kiddos who were playing ball games played ball games for about 67% of the observation interval. Their next most salient activity was talking. Typically developing girls, their most spent most of their time in joint engage. And they spent most of their time um, within joint engage, their most salient activities were talking and flitting. Flitting. What is flitting? Flitting, we coded flitting when girls moved to three or more activities for about equal amounts of time during one observation interval. And you can picture it, can't you? <laughs> Boys with autism, their most salient engagement state, they spent most of their time solitary, and their most salient activities were wandering which they wandered for about 41% of the observation interval and talking. In fact, boys with autism spent significantly more time in solitary than every other group. Girls with autism spent a majority of their recess or their observation intervals in joint engage, followed closely by solitary. So this most salient joint engage activity was talking, which they talked for about 44% of the observation interval, and flitting. Girls with autism also like to flit, except for they were flitting in solitary and not joint engage. So our research supports the camouflage hypothesis, suggesting that the female social landscape at school provides a perfect backdrop for girls with autism to camouflage. Because typically developing girls are very fluid in their social behaviors. They move from group to group. And it's very easy for the girl with autism to blend in because they are often hovering close by. So if I am a playground supervisor and I'm looking at the yard, I am going to have a very difficult time recognizing the social challenges of girls because they look like the typically developing girls. Except girls with autism are flitting in between joint engage and solitary and joint engage and solitary. And this tells us that although the social challenges of girls with autism may be difficult, uh, would, might be difficult for an adult to detect from a distance, these social challenges do not appear to be hidden from their peers. 
So we want to take a look more, uh, we want to work with girls, uh, work with school personnel and providers to help them better detect the social behavior challenges of girls with autism. Now in contrast, the male social landscape makes it much easier to detect the social challenges of boys. Typically developing boys tend to be playing these structured games with rules for the duration of recess. So it's pretty easy to, de to detect the social challenges of boys because they are not playing the game. So, as we, so that helps boys with autism get better access to services because their social challenges are easier to identify. So, Boys with autism socialize differently than girls with autism, and much of this is due to the social landscape with, and their choices of friends. So if girls like to hang out with girls and boys like to hang out with boys, they are trying to get into different social groups. And the social behaviors required to be successful in a male group is different than the social behaviors required to be in a female group. Boys are easier to detect because boys with autism are easier to detect because they are not playing the game. Girls with autism, on the other hand, their challenges are more difficult to detect because they look a lot like typically developing girls. So girls with autism have often been described as having a relative strength because of their ability to camouflage or because of their ability to use compensatory skills. However, compensatory skills are only a strength to the extent that someone gets their needs met, either through mutual peer relationships or through intervention. So we want to look more closely at where these social breakdowns are happening with girls because they were actually being pretty successful in getting some time in joint engagement. They just couldn't sustain their time there. So future research should look at where communication breakdowns are happening so we can help do targeted interventions to help these girls become more successful. So making friends in inclusive settings. We know that social interventions plus inclusion is beneficial to individuals with autism to help them build and maintain their social relationships or build so their skills. We also know that peer mentors are helpful. They help teach the, uh, they help the students with autism gain access into the normative peer culture and these facilitated opportunities with an adult there to help with help facilitate the social interactions are beneficial for the individuals with autism, both at elementary school and at adolescent levels, secondary levels. And we also really want to pay attention to how additional factors impact students' social outcomes, either by choice of intervention or looking at the most appropriate intervention for students, or looking at the way social uh, social experiences are out in naturalistic settings. So the common practice in school is that we just put kids in interventions when we get them on our caseload, or we put kids in intervention when we get them, uh, when we recruit them into our study. And the next step is to look more closely at the constellation of traits with individuals to determine which interventions are most appropriate for which kids. Thank you.